How's everybody doing? <laughs> it's a nice crisp Wednesday, at least by Hawaiian standards. We'll take it, right? I hope you guys are well, but it's 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 just good to be able to get out and to, to be together. So um, let's stand, let's worship Jesus together tonight. Lord Jesus, we're we're grateful to be here. God, we're we're thankful that we can be here with our friends, with our family, Lord God, that we can that we can worship you in spirit and in truth, that we can see um, one another and in a time when it's, it's hard to get together, it's hard to be um, together, Lord God. We're, we're grateful for the, the numbers going the right direction, that this, we really pray that this pandemic would continue to, um, to wind down, and Lord God, that, that health and blessings would prevail on this island and around the world. In your name we pray. Amen. I lean not on my own understanding. Let's stand and see. My life is in the hands of the kingdom of heaven. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven. I give it all to you, God. Trust in that you'll make something beautiful out of me. I give it all to you, God. Trust in that you'll make something beautiful out of me. I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. And I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. There's nothing I hold on to. 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 I lean not on my own understanding. My life heals in the hands. Of the maker of heaven, I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hand of the maker of heaven. I give it all to you, God. Trust in that you'll make something beautiful out of me. I give it all to you, God. Trust in that you'll make something beautiful out of me. And I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. This mountain with my hands wide open, I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. Nothing I hold on to. There's 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 nothing I hold on to.
Set my face against the wind I defy the phantoms that besiege me And I can't carry the weight of this world Unless you lift it with me So hold on to my hand And don't let me fall I'll rise once more Though I don't feel like it It's one that I will surely win And I will see your face Cause I open up my heart Cause you love me from the start Jesus, come in. Spirit, come live in inside of me. I open my heart. I open up my heart. Cause you love me from the start. I want to let you in And I open up my heart Cause you love me from the start Stories of one day. Think 
you're like what I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never all alone you're a good good father to you
perfect in all your ways Perfect in all of your ways You're perfect in all your ways But you always You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are Lord Jesus, we just ask that you wrap your arms around us tonight. We declare that you are the one true God, the one true perfect Father. That you never mess up and you never let us down and you've always, always been there. And as much as I try as a dad, I, I just fail. I fail over and over again, but... I'm grateful for your grace. I'm grateful for your love. I'm grateful for the, that you are the good, one, true, perfect Father. We love you, Jesus. We worship you here tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Do me a favor and thank Joel and the band for leading us in worship tonight. And I also want to thank our greeter, Sophie. Sophie, would you stand up and let's thank Sophie for doing such a great job as our greeter tonight. And just sort of do some shakas and air hugs and high fives at each other around the room. Make sure everybody feels welcome tonight. We're glad that you're all here. Glad for everybody watching online tonight, too. I don't know which camera I'm on right now, so glad you guys are with us. I've been chatting with several of you uh, tonight as well. We got a fella from India watching tonight. We got some folks from Thailand watching tonight. We got people all over the United States watching too. So we're glad you guys are with us. Be sure to click that share button if you haven't done it already. Help us extend our reach. So there's three ways to support the church financially. Number one, you can use the Yay God boxes out in the lobby. You can use the online giving option. You see the link for that on the screens, or you can send to the P.O. box here in Waikoloa. That's a great way. To do it as well. We really appreciate all of your financial support on the ministries that God's calling us to do. Every single penny helps. Well, we're in a second part of a five-part message series. This series is called Money Matters, and we're talking about being rich. We're talking about having wealth. We're talking about what we should be doing with the money that God has entrusted to us. And so far, we've said that wanting more isn't always bad, but we often get distracted by looking for satisfaction in the wrong places. Do you agree with that? If you do, would you say amen? So it's not about what we have, but it's what we do with what we have that really matters. Let me say that again. It's not about what we have, it's what we do with what we have that really matters. So do you have your stuff, or does your stuff have you? And we talked a little bit about being rich in what matters most. If you missed last week, I want to review a little bit. We covered some good news and we covered some bad news. If you were here last week and you remember, what's the good news? You're rich, right. We learned last week the good news is we're already rich, right? And some of you are saying, well, I don't feel rich. That's because you missed last week. If you'd have heard last week, you'd have known you were rich. So we discovered last week, if you make just $33,000 a year or more, you are in the top 1% of wage earners in the world alive today. That's amazing to think about. You may not be a one percenter in the United States, but you are a one percenter worldwide. And we said last week, some of you are mega wealthy. If you make $80,000 a year or more, you are in the top 10th of 1% of wage earners worldwide. You are richer than 99.9% .9 of the rest of the people in the world. So we admitted this several times last week. We're going to put it up on the screen. If you would say it with me again, God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich. That's the good news. And then we also learned some bad news. If you were here last week, help me out again. What's the bad news? 
I'm rich. That's the bad news, too. The bad news is we're rich. The good news is we're rich, and the bad news is we're also rich. And that really is bad news, not to mention that we have rich people problems, you know? Things like you couldn't get a hair appointment when you wanted. They put pickles on both of your hamburgers when you explicitly ask them not to do that. Your cell phone coverage doesn't work very well when you're in your back bathroom, so you can't do business while you're doing your business. You know what I'm saying? And so the bad news about being rich is not only those rich people problems we just talked about, but we also do have a significant spiritual challenges as well because we're rich. And last week we looked at that reality, just to recap that briefly. First problem, it's harder for us to depend on God. When you're rich, the wealthier you are, the harder it is for you to depend on God. The easier it becomes for you to put your hope in what you have than to keep your hope in God alone. And the second problem our wealth does is it distracts us from true priorities. Because we've been blessed with more than most, we have many opportunities that can end up taking us away from what our true priorities should be. And then the third big challenge with our wealth is this. We need to understand we have a greater responsibility. God has given us more than most people in the world, and because he's given us so much, he expects more from us. And so what I want to do today is build off of that idea. I want to talk to you tonight about the deceitfulness of riches. That's actually a phrase Jesus himself used. It's recorded in the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel. Jesus was explaining a parable that he had just told uh, to the people that were gathered around him, and he was then later explaining it to the disciples, what the symbolism meant in this parable. And so the parable was, he told about a sower, a planter of seeds, who went out and planted seeds in four different types of soil. And one of the four types of soil, only one of them, was what he called good soil. Only one of those four types of soil actually produced any growth. The others all had problems. And so then later, Jesus explained that the seed that he'd referred to was a symbol for his teachings, what we would call the Word, the Word of God, right? And it was about the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, look, each soil type I just talked about actually represents the heart and the mind of the type of person who is hearing the Word of God. And then Jesus said this in verse 22, And the one sown with seed among the thorns... This is the one who hears the word, and the anxiety of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. He's saying the deceitfulness of wealth can do what? Choke out our spiritual growth. And so I want to dive in detail tonight about the deceitfulness of riches. So let me give you an example. I don't know if any of you have ever been to a Dave and Buster's or a Chuck E. Cheese, or some other kind of restaurant or pizza place where, you know, after you eat, the kids get to go play games, and they can win tickets, right? And if they play the games right, they win a bunch of tickets. You know what I'm talking about, right? And so every now and then, if your kids aren't doing it right, of course, you have to move them out of the way, and you have to show them how it's done, and you got to do the ski ball yourself, because you got to win some tickets, right? Tickets like these, we've seen these before, these Chuck E. Cheese tickets, right? And because we tend to believe, even if you've been through the drill before, if I can just get enough tickets, I will win a prize that will change my life. If I can just get enough tickets, I'm going to win the prize. And so you go and you spend like $75 of quarters on skee-ball and you get a bunch of tickets and you win like 1,743 tickets and then you go cash them in and you get something like this. I don't know if you can see this. Can you switch to this front camera, Ned? I want to make sure the online folks see this too. So you win something like that for your 1,743 tickets right? And you're like, what is going on? That, that's a puny prize. That's all I got. But it doesn't matter. You go back the next time and you're like, hey, I'll get more tickets. I'll get 2,000 plus tickets this time. And then I'm going to be able to go get that really cool prize. And that will make me happy. Well, then what happens? We grow up and we become adults and the tickets change. And we start to believe if I can get enough of these tickets, right? then I'll be happy, then I'll be satisfied, then I'll have significance, and then I'll feel secure. And the problem is, just like those Chuck E. Cheese tickets, can you put that, those dollars up again in that? Just like those Chuck E. Cheese tickets, these tickets, they also promise 
way more than they actually deliver. And so as we talk about the deceitfulness of riches tonight, I just want to share with you a key thought. If you're taking notes, the key thought is this. The world wants you to serve money instead of serving God. That's the truth. The world wants you to serve money instead of serving God. And you cannot serve both. You have to choose one or the other. In fact, Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 24. He said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. Now, why do you think Jesus said you can't serve both God and money? Well, I would argue because money is such an attractive false god. And Jesus knew, for many of us, money would be the number one competitor for our hearts. For so many of us, money and things and the promise of what wealth can bring and what wealth can buy, that will be our number one pursuit in life, the number one competitor for our hearts between us and God. You cannot, Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and money. Money promises but cannot deliver what only God can provide. Let me say that again. Money promises, but cannot deliver what only God can provide. So what does money promise? Well, many, many things, but let's just talk about two tonight. Number one, money promises happiness, right? We say, if I could just get enough money, I would finally be happy. And think about it. We've all bought into this at some point. If I just had a little bit more in my money stack of tickets, then I could buy the thing that would make me happy. And I don't know what it would be for you. Maybe it would be, you know, if I had more money, I could buy the shoes that would match the dress, that would match the hat, that would match the bracelet that I got for 50% off. And then I would have the greatest outfit ever. It would be complete and I would finally be happy. Or maybe for you, it'd be, if I only had more money, I could attract a supermodel girlfriend right? If I only had enough money, I could buy a house with five bathrooms and six bedrooms and a four-car garage for my four brand new sports cars. I could have the perfect house and the perfect spouse. Yeah, glory to God. Amen, right? I would be so happy then if I just had enough money. And the reality is, though, listen, don't miss this. Listen, it doesn't matter how much you have because only God can provide lasting joy. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. You can get more and more and more and more and more, but no matter how much you have, you're still going to want even more and even more and even more and even more because money cannot provide happiness. Only God provides lasting joy, and he does that through his son, Jesus. So number one, money falsely promises happiness. Number two, money falsely promises security. We also believe if I just had enough money, then I would be secure. I would be safe. Everything would be cool in my life, right? I could pay off my debt. I could put some money in my savings for a rainy day. Then life would feel safe and secure. But the truth is, you can still have a whole lot of money, and someone in your life can still get really sick, and then you realize money can't buy my way out of this situation. Steve Jobs, one of the richest people in the world at the time, he tried as hard as he could to buy his way out of cancer. He did every experimental thing you could find. He flew all over the world to find these miracle cures, and it didn't help. In the end, cancer got him. He couldn't beat it. And so when a tragedy like that hits you, suddenly that's when you realize, if you haven't realized before, true security does not come in what money buys, but only in what God is. True security does not come in what money buys, but only in who God is. Money promises what only God can provide. Now, most of us would say, well, I would never serve money, right? But I would argue with you rather gently, if you've ever bought something you did not need with money you did not have to impress people you did not like, you are somewhat under the power of money. You were believing that this money ticket, what it buys, would make you happy or that it would bring some level of meaning to your life. Give you another example. If you've ever compromised your integrity and cheated on an expense report, or you downloaded music or a movie that you did not pay for, 
Or you told your 16-year-old that he's 11 when you got to Disney World because 12 and under is cheaper. And you're telling the ticket agent, sure, I know he shaves, but he's 11, I swear. He's 11, right? You are serving money. You're under the illusion that a little more money is going to bring your life a little more security. If you've ever compromised your family, if you've ever neglected them with workaholism, believing that you were providing more for them, then I would argue you are at least somewhat under the power of money. And what's happening? It's a false God that's promising what only the true God can provide. And since we are rich, right? We've already established that. Since we are rich, we need to acknowledge that we are. We want to be good at being rich. And so last week we spent a lot of time on some advice Paul gave to Timothy. And he was telling Timothy, I want you to pass this advice on to the rich people in your congregation. So let's read Paul's words. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And we had a key statement that week too, last week. We said it once already tonight, but would you do me a favor and let's say it again. We'll put it on the screen. God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich. Now, each week, we're going to add a little bit to this statement. It's going to get longer and longer as these five weeks go on. So this week, we're going to add this phrase. I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. Would you say that with me? I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. Then let's put the whole statement together. Start from the beginning. God has blessed me with more than I need. I'm rich. I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. One more time. Let's say it all together. God has blessed me with more than I need. I'm rich. I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. Seems very simple. But the problem is money continues to scream at us, no, if you just have more of me, you will be happy. And if you just have more of me, you will feel secure and significant. And so what I want to do is I want to drive some thoughts deep into your hearts tonight. And I want to show you three problems that are there for people who love and trust money. And so if you'll drop your guard a little bit tonight and you'll work with me, I believe you might sometimes see yourself in one of these things, as I sometimes see myself in one of these challenges as well. The first thing, if you're taking notes, number one, people who love and trust money never have enough. They never have enough. Solomon said this, one who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor one who loves abundance with its income. This, too, is futility. If money is what you love and trust, then it doesn't matter how big your stack of money tickets gets, you're still going to want more. Whether you're making $20,000 or $40,000 or $100,000 or $200,000 a year or more, if I ask you, hey, how big does your stack need to be for you to feel secure, the answer will always be just a little bit more than I currently have, right? It's always the answer for someone who loves and trusts in money every single time. If you love and trust money, it does not matter how much you get. It will never be enough. You will always need at least a little bit more. And many of you, you don't believe that because you haven't had more yet. But you watch. Many of you, you've got twice as much today as you did 10 years ago. And if you weren't happy then, you're still not going to be happy now because you're still going to want more, right? Ten years from now, you might be making two times, three times what you make now, and it may still not be enough if you're trusting in money because it's all an illusion. It's the deceitfulness of riches. It's promising something that it can never deliver. In fact, Proverbs 18, 11 tells us this, and I love the imagery in this verse. A rich person's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his own imagination. In other words, if I can get enough of this 
then I can buy away all the bad things in my life. My wealth will be like a strong city, a tall wall, a tower around me. My wealth will protect me. And so they begin to think of their wealth as a strong defense, and they do this imagining, right? But it's only in their imagination. It's all make-believe. We're imagining that if our stack of money tickets is big enough, we'll be happy, we'll be secure, we'll be able to buy the really cool prizes of life, and we'll love it. It's the deceitfulness of riches. Wealth promises something it cannot actually provide, okay? Now, if that hasn't felt personal yet, hang on, I think I'm getting to you, right? Because I'm going to offend everybody tonight. I'm an equal opportunity offender. Okay, first, people who love and trust money, number one, they never have enough. Here's the second problem. People who love and trust money find it increasingly difficult to give big. They find it increasingly difficult to give big. I've heard pastors tell this story probably a hundred different times, and sometimes they say it happened to them, and sometimes they say it happened to somebody. It never happened to me, but I'll just tell you the story. There was a pastor who had a guy in his congregation come to him. He said, you know, uh, when I was only making $10,000 a year, it was easy for me to tithe. It was nothing to drop that 10% in the bucket, but now, you know, I make $200,000 a year, and writing a check for $20,000 a year, that's really tough. I, I, I really have a tough time doing that. That's how much I made, you know, years ago. He said, can you pray for me, Pastor? He said, sure, I'll pray for you. Lord, please reduce this man's income back to $20,000 so it doesn't feel so hard to give, right? That's, that's the thing. People who love and trust money, they find it increasingly difficult to give big because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, there are some of you here tonight in person or watching online who would love to give big, right? But you don't feel like you can afford it. You believe in what God is doing through the church. You'd like to do even more, but you just say, "Mm, I just, I can't afford it, right? I can't afford to do it. Or you see somebody in need outside in the community and you look and you say, gosh, I'd really love to help them out. I'd love to be able to give that server a huge tip. I just, I know she's really struggling and boy, that'd just really bless her if I could just give her a $500 tip today. That would blow her mind. That would just do great things, but I can't afford it. Oh, I know this person, they're they're not making rent. They're they're not able to feed their kids, and I would love to big help them, give them a big gift, but I just, I can't afford it, right? Or whatever the huge need is, you see, you just don't feel like you can afford it because in your mind, in your imagination, mm, my stack is just not quite big enough yet. I need a bigger stack of money tickets, and then, then I'll have enough to share with others. And what's crazy, but this has been proven over and over again in all kinds of studies, is that wealthier people are, on average, and there are, of course, exceptions to every rule, but generally, the wealthier people are, the smaller percentage of their wealth they give to charitable causes. And you know who gives the largest percentage on average in our country? There's been all kinds of studies that prove this. Those who make 12000 or less a year, those who make the least give the highest percentage away to charitable causes. And again, obviously there are exceptions to that rule. But on average, it's been proven again and again that the bigger the stack is, the smaller the percentage of it people will give to charitable causes causes. And that's not how to be rich at what matters most. That's not how to be rich and honor God. That's how to be selfish and being bad at being rich. And in fact, Jesus evidently didn't care as much about the amounts we give as he did about the percentage and the motive of our giving. We see this in Mark 12. And Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and began watching how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people We're putting in large amounts. And a poor widow came and put in two lepta coins, which amounts to a quadrants. And calling his disciples to him, it's basically two cents, two pennies, right? Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Jesus says she gave more than everybody else combined. 
Now, the wealthy there, they obviously gave far more overall cash in the amounts they gave, but it was still just a very small percentage of what they actually had. So we put this in modern terms for us. It would be like if Jeff Bezos of Amazon tossed $100,000 in our Yay God box tonight. Right? That's a lot of dough, and we would certainly appreciate it, Jeff, if you're watching, Mr. Bezos, we would really appreciate it if you would want to do that. But let's be honest, $100,000 to Jeff Bezos, that costs him very little. In fact, that's only percent of his net worth, $100,000. I currently with my uh, uh, pension and IRA stuff, I have a net worth of maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, right? So if I toss in 34 cents, I still gave more sacrificially <laughs> than Jeff Bezos' hundred grand, right? But now, think about this. The widow, with her two-cent gift, blows my 34 cents right out of the water, Right? Jesus was not impressed by the amount given. He was impressed by the percentage given. And the widow gave all that she had, 100%. We say, how could someone with no stack to speak of give it all away? And the reason is the widow wasn't trusting in her stack. She was trusting in him who richly provides. She was trusting in God. And what we tend to say so often is, look, I'll start to give big when this other thing is taken care of first. I'll start to give big when we finally have the house we want. I'll start to give big when we finally get back from this huge vacation we've been planning for several years. I'll start to give big if we get the kids through college, right? I'll start to give big when, or I'll start to give big if We need to change that to, you know what, Lord, I'm going to give big right now because I'm already blessed. Would you say this phrase with me again? God has blessed me with more than I need. I'm rich. I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. God tells us in that passage that uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, he wants us to be rich in good deeds. He wants us to be generous. He wants us to be willing to. To share, So that's what we need to do, because we don't want to stink at being rich. We want to be good at being rich, and we need to be good at what matters the most. So number one, here's the problems. If you love and trust money, you will never have enough. That's the first problem. Number two, if you love and trust money, you will find it increasingly difficult to give big. And the third and final thing we want to talk about tonight is, if you love and trust money, you may have money in the bank, but you won't have peace in your heart. Now, some of you would say, well, technically, Greg, I don't have any money in the bank. And I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. You're like, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I got nothing in my savings. I know what you're saying. But look, you still got some toys in the garage, or you've still got some clothes in the closet, or you got food in the cabinet, you got a roof over your head, you got a bed to sleep in, you've got clean running water, you've got electricity. You're blessed, right? But if you love and trust in the stuff, here's the problem. You can have all this stuff and still have no peace in your heart, no matter how big your pile of stuff grows. In fact, Solomon in Proverbs 15, 16, he said something that is such an important principle uh, that honestly, my, my gut is that most people don't believe this to be true. It's in the Bible, but even most Christians don't believe it. But I want to read it to you, and if you will believe this tonight, if you'll say, I'm, I'm accepting that as the true word of God, I believe that, it can change your entire posture in how you do life. Here's what Solomon said. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with the treasure. Let me say it again. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with the treasure. Better to have a little bit with a lot of God than a lot of junk with no God and a lot of tension. And most people don't believe it. They don't believe that's true. Now, when I tell you that, here's what many of you might be thinking, okay? What you might be thinking is, well, let's, let's test this theory out, Greg. Why don't you give me Bill Gates' money? Why don't you give me Warren Buffett's money? Why don't you give me Jeff Bezos' money, and let's see how I can do 
with it, right? Trust me with that amount of wealth, and let's see how I do. Give me some of their problems, too. That's fine. That's fair. Give me some of their problems, and we'll just see if my life is better with their money and their problems instead of my money and my problems. All right, let's try that out. And that's what most people are thinking, and it's because they don't really believe what Solomon just said. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil, because with great wealth comes great problems. First of all, it's harder to depend on God. It distracts you from true priorities, and you have such a greater responsibility. I mean, it's incredibly difficult to have you know, the next generation be responsible when their view of reality can get so distorted. It's a significant challenge. And here's the deal. You may not be a billionaire. You may not be a millionaire. You may not be a thousandaire. But we're still rich. We are. We're richer than 99% of the people in the world. Some of us richer than 99.9% of the people in the world. And when we continue to put our hope in money, it takes us off the track of what matters most. And so let me just say this as lovingly as I can, and I may be a little bit in your face right now, but if I am, it's only because I care. There are some of you right now, you make more than your parents ever made. You make more than you ever thought you would make, and yet, if you're honest, you'd say, I'm still financially strapped, and I'm still miserable. And you're thinking, I just need more. If I just had more, just a little more, just a little more. And you already have way more than you ever thought you would. And the reason you're still strapped, if that's your story, is because you still consume everything God gives to you. And quite honestly, there are other people around that make a third of what you make, and they're not financially strapped. And they look at you and your situation, and they can't figure out why you're so financially stressed all the time. Because they've come to realize it's better to live on less. It's better to be a blessing. It's better to not buy into the deceitfulness of riches. And the bottom line is, if you honestly believe that more money will solve most of your problems, you are still under the influence of money. Because more money will not solve most of your problems. What will solve most of your problems is more Jesus. More Jesus will solve your problems. Some of you maybe still don't believe it. You really think money's what I need. I just need some more money. But the reality is, more money is not what's going to keep the kids off drugs. More money is not going to make the marriage better because if you don't love each other when you got no money, you're definitely going to fight about money when you have more money, right? More Jesus is what you need. More Jesus brings intimacy. More Jesus brings healing. More Jesus brings focus. More Jesus brings power. More Jesus brings purpose. More Jesus brings the divine into this world. And that's what we need is more Jesus. Do you agree with that? Would you just say Amen. What we need is more Jesus. So instead of saying, ah, I just want some more money, listen, you're never going to have enough money. What we want is, I want more Jesus. I want more Christ. I want more of his purpose. I want more of his direction. I want less of me and more of him. And I don't want to be distracted by the things that do not last. I don't want to trade in all my tickets for a crummy toy and realize it's all going to burn away in the end. I want to use what God has given me for His glory. So I'm not going to wait to give later. I'm going to give now because I'm already blessed now. And so at whatever level you are, whatever level giving big means to you, give big wherever you are. And you don't have to give it to this church. My salary stays the same whether you give a dollar or a million dollars. I still make the same. I'm not saying you have to give it here. I don't care where God leads you to give, but wherever God leads you to give, give somewhere big, man. Give big somewhere. Give like the rich people you are. Give like the people who are rich in what really matters, the way we're supposed to give. Be generous, not later. Be generous now. And don't dare walk around with money in the bank and stuff in the closet, but no peace in your heart. Jesus is peace. Jesus is the peace that passes understanding. Jesus is the peace in your relationships that comes when you know you are serving him to the best of your ability. Jesus is the peace to know that you're joining together in prayer 
to cover your family with the Spirit's protection, the peace to know that you've got godly friends around you, and to be able to say, look, we're not going to serve money. Money's neutral. Money's not bad. Money's not uh, good. The love of money is evil, but money itself is not bad or good. We just don't want to serve money. We don't want to love money. That's what makes it a bad God. We need to serve God. Money is going to serve us as we serve God. God. We don't serve money, we serve God. Paul says, command those who are rich in this present world, and in the context, that's us today, this is our present world, and we're the ones who are rich, not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but instead put their hope in God, who does what? He richly provides us with everything we need for our enjoyment. Command them to do good to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. And if we do that, what happens? We take hold of the life that is truly life. We are set free from the deceitfulness of riches. You see, let's say it one more time as we close. God has blessed us with more than we need. We are rich. We will not trust in riches, but in Him who richly provides. Amen. Joel, would you come and let's uh, have a closing worship song together to bring this whole thing home. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are and the truth of your word that so often goes against uh, common sense worldly values. So much so that we're so indoctrinated by the, the message the world preaches at us all the time that when we hear you say the opposite, it, it kind of checks us in our, our heart for a minute. We say, oh, that can't be true. Here's what I've always heard. This is what I heard makes you happy. This is what I heard makes you feel secure. But we just need to trust you, God. You wouldn't steer us wrong. We can't outgive God, your Bible says. The cattle on a thousand hills all belong to you. It's impossible to outgive you. If you call us to give to some charitable cause we need to trust that you won't set us up for failure if you've put it in our heart to give you've already got a plan to replace what we've given and probably give us more so that we can give more later not so that we can get rich it's not so we can get richer it's not to build our money stacks or our closet stacks or our garage stacks it's not to do any of that it's to be set up to be generous to share to be good at being rich at what matters most. So I pray for all of us tonight, God, that we would just have a moment of reflection this week to recognize how blessed we really are and say, why did God trust me with this amount of his stuff? Because everything belongs to you. We know that. You're the creator of everything. Everything's made of the stuff that you created. It all belongs to you. We belong to you. Why, God, why did you trust me with this amount of your stuff as a steward of your stuff? What am I supposed to be doing with this? How am I supposed to be investing this for your kingdom, for your glory, for your way? Show me, Lord. Tell me where to give. Tell me how to give. And let my answer be yes, 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 even before you reveal the specifics. Whatever you tell me to do, God, I want to say yes. I'm going to trust you because it's better to have little and have a great connection and relationship with you as my God than to have vast amounts of treasure and still have turmoil and no peace in my heart, in my family. God, guide us to be good at being rich for your glory. That's my prayer for all of us tonight. Lord, I pray for anyone who's watching tonight online, anyone who might be here tonight, and you're saying, you know, I've never really made a connection, this relationship with God you're talking about, about praying with God and asking Him to reveal things to me. I've never never had that kind of relationship. Uh, That sounds great to me. How do I get a relationship with God like that? And the short answer is it only comes through Jesus. It comes through what He did for us on the cross. Jesus came and lived a perfect life. He never sinned once. He never made a mistake. He never did anything wrong or evil, not one time. 
And then he went to the cross and he took on all of the things we did wrong. All of the things every human being, past, present, and future, would ever do. Every sin, every error, every mistake in judgment, every evil or negative thought, everything we've ever done or thought of doing wrong. Jesus took all of our sins upon himself and he paid the punishment. He paid the penalty for all of that. And then it goes even beyond that. He then said, look, if you'll trust me and if you'll follow me, I will give you credit for my perfect righteousness, for my perfect behavior. It'll be just as if you had never sinned yourself. We'll wash your slate completely clean. You get a do-over. And all you have to do is put your trust and faith in me, that I am who I say I am, that I did what the Bible says I did on the cross for you, and that I'm going to do everything the Bible promises I'm going to do in the future. If you put your trust, your confidence in me, that I am who I say I am, and that I'm going to do everything I promise to do, you won't be disappointed. Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Take your place as the true God of my life. Maybe money and stuff has kind of been the God of my life. I don't want to do that anymore. Maybe I've been the God of my own life, making my own moral decisions. I don't want to be that God anymore. I'm a terrible God. I want you to take your rightful place as God in my life. Be the Lord of my life. And Jesus, thank you for your offer to be the Savior of my life, the one who saves me from my sins, who saves me from my punishment, and instead offers me a path to eternal life, a path to righteousness where I'm not counted as sinful anymore. I want you to be the Savior of my life too, the Lord and the Savior of my life. I want to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. If that's the prayer of your heart tonight, you can just say, me too, God, me too. That's my prayer. What Pastor G just prayed, that's exactly how I feel tonight. Help me make this start today. Maybe it's the first time you've ever made that kind of a decision. Maybe you've said something like that, prayed something like that in the past, and then you kind of fell away from that commitment, and things got a little sloppy and a little crazy in your life, and now it's time to get back to what you know is real, and so this is a recommitment moment for you. We've, we've all been in all of those situations. Ain't nobody perfect on this world except Jesus. So God, bless each one who's prayed a prayer like that tonight. And if anybody wants to just tell me, hey, Greg, I prayed that prayer for the first time tonight. I became a follower of Jesus Christ for the first time. Would you send me an email, pastorgregscott at gmail.com, pastorgregscott at gmail.com, and say, Greg, I just became a follower of Jesus. What's the next step? What do I do to get a good start in that new relationship? And you will make my week if I hear from you with that kind of a, a truth, that kind of a great news story. God, bless each one who's here tonight. Bless each one watching online, wherever they are. Help them remember to hit that share button, God. Help us get the word out to more people around the world. Increase the reach of this ministry so that you can get more glory. You deserve it all. God bless all of you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, we just lay it all out before you. God, my life is yours. Everything I have is yours. My hope, my future, my family, what, what riches and wealth I have, God. I'm so grateful, but Lord, it's all yours. We love you and we worship you here tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week.